I want to share with you in our time together today, I want to share with you in our time together today, something that the Holy Spirit really put on my heart. Uh, recently, I was driving down the road, and I felt this one verse so strong, I literally pull to the side of the road and Regina start taking some notes down from this one verse of scripture. And it's the 23rd Psalm. Many of you love that Psalm. You've quoted that Psalm. You've heard that Psalm. Um, I just want us to look at the, the one verse, verse, uh, verse number six. And it says this, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will, those are the two words, I will. Can we say those two words together? I will. He says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I think it's powerful. I would like that to be said about my life. I'm going to be 51 in a few months, but I would like it to, to be said that whenever I get to the end of my life, the end of my journey, that I had lived a life that said, I'm, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm going to stay in the house of the Lord. I'm going to be committed to the house of the Lord. He said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When you think about those words, the house of the Lord, AJ, if we were to back up thousands of years and ask maybe even the psalmist, Carrie, if we said, what does the house of the Lord mean to you? If we were to back up into Old Testament eras and times, what does the house of the Lord mean to you? Some people, some people would tell us that, that the house of the Lord, Joel, for them, meant a tent, tabernacle. For some, they would say the house of the Lord meant a, meant a temple. For others, they would say a synagogue. I have had the opportunity to be in places in the Holy Land that had such spiritual meanings to me and moments for me. The upper room was one of them where they believe Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit is given to the early church, the power to witness. I've been there. That's a special place. I, I have been to places where they believe temples were and there's still some of the infrastructure there. And I have laid on the ground in the one particular area where they believe that people would come and bring their sacrifices and they have found artifacts and they have found broken pottery and I laid on the ground there. It seemed like such holy ground. For you and I, when we hear the house of the Lord, maybe you would go back to that country church or your childhood. I was talking to a gentleman today. It was bringing up about pews and how years and years ago they would put even platelets on the pews. This is the Smith family, or this is. Some pews were wooden. Some pews had padding. People would have memories about the house of the Lord, what that would look like to them. That sounds like when they hear those words. For our church, we started in the basement of a hotel, Park Place Hotel. And so when I look at what will be in March, 21 years of our church and thinking about the house of the Lord, I, my mind could go to a hotel. I could also go to homes. I have a lot of homes memories where people would gather and we would meet in a home a life group, a community group, a prayer group. You think about the house of the Lord, it would be very common for many people to immediately think property, 
which is good. Some of those buildings and spaces and places have very key parts of our hearts. I, when I remember my childhood in Juniper, kids' ministry, children's ministry was in the basement of this church, cinder block, and that pencil sharpener on the wall. Scott Rideout, who worked at the local mill, uh, was our Sunday school teacher. And he would try to take these things and put them on these like flannels and like these little, and be falling off or like let go and be hanging sideways and be like five or six of us in there, not a big class. Half the time, Scott probably thought he's wasting his time talking to us. Probably never imagining that out of that classroom, not only would come someone pastoring in Belleville, Ohio, but others who would go on to have impact and influence, and Scott probably had no idea. When we're eight or ten wanting to get out of the class, to go to the back, they had this big swing set in the back of the church. We couldn't wait for Scott to stop talking so we could go outside. We think of properties, but we would also think of people. Scott's one of many that have influenced my life. We would think of people here. When someone says story side, we don't just think of 541 State Route 97 and 41 acres. We don't just think of 60 some thousand square feet of space. When someone says story side, it would be very easy for us to start thinking, I love the Thomases. I love the Zook family. I love the Bullets. I love the Coopers, I love the Wades, I love the Houchins, I love the Santriellas, I love the Borden Kirchers, I love Debbie Gwill, I love Sandy. And you could go around, maybe you would look down your row or you find yourself in the lobby. Thank God for the property. But I'm really grateful for God's people. Charles Spurgeon said this, I believe that every Christian ought to be joined to some visible church. That is his plain duty according to the scriptures. God's people are not dogs. Else, they might go about one by one, but they are they're sheep. Therefore, they should be in, they should be in flocks. When I think about What I love about God's house, or in a general sense, what do we love about God's house? Or Carrie, if I was to ask you, what do you love about God's house? I think, Jen, I think we could make a whole list of things we love about God's house. Like when I started thinking about this Tom and pulled to the side of the road and the subsequent time since, but when I think about what I love about God's house, one of the things that would come to my mind, is I love the care that comes with God's house. Care. This week, Angel and I, on Friday, Friday's our date day, and it started with my daughter Jalen, who's getting married in June, and Mary and Corbin, and they've been looking at some houses and trying to find a house. And so one of the houses that they're looking at, we, we drove Friday, we had a coffee, we go look at the house. And then from that, Angel and I drive to Mount Vernon and we went and sang happy birthday to Phil, uh, who turned 83, I believe he's watching online right now, Phil turned 83 this weekend. And we sang happy birthday to him, he's there in the bed and tears and Angel and I are, are singing to Phil and pray with them, and then we go to the hospital uh, while we were there, and and we prayed with Rendell Shira. Rendell, great man, he's on our worship team, and Rendell is is in the hospital in Mount Vernon, had surgery on his hip and and some other things that have been part of, of that process with the healing, and Angel and I went to pray for Rendell. And while we are there, Rendell begins to share with me, these people have prayed for me, these people have texted me, these people have visited me. Craig and Cindy Lewis was here last night. 
And while we're there, I ask Angel to pray, and my wife starts praying. I mean, like this. I, was, my, I love when my wife prays, but I felt like she even took it up a notch. I have Rendell's hand here. She's on the other side of the bed, has Rendell's hand. And I mean, she is praying. Like almost like the prayer, like we are waging war for Rendell's life and future. And I didn't realize in the moment, I, I loved it, but I didn't realize in the moment we finished praying and my wife starts telling Rendell, Rendell, your hand is freezing cold. You have no blood circulation in this hand. We need to pray the blood's flowing. And Rendell says, pulls up the blanket, somebody's like, oh, I have a big ice pack on my hip. <laughs> my hand's been on the ice pack the whole time. We were relieved. We're like, he's alive. Like, it's a miracle. <laughs> I was trying not to like lose it laughing, but then her prayer made sense. Like, I mean, she was going to God with Rendell's cold hand. God, let the blood flow, let the circulation. Let... But my point is, because there's a lot of things that would come to mind, but when I talk about what I love about God's church, I love the care. I love the fact that I don't walk into Rendell's room and Rendell says, no one's text, no one's called, no one's stopped by, no one. I love that I walk in and it's like this person has reached out and this person called and this person, he starts telling me. Paul and Rebecca Stover said they'd come over to the house and do chores or errands if needed. This He starts saying all these kinds of things. People said they'd be willing to help with this. And Now I know people say, can I be a Christian all by myself? Sure. Sure. I'm just saying there's something about the body of Christ that brings an element of care that I love. This week, and I'm hugging them as they're leaving today, but the Garretts have been back and forth to the hospital with, with their daughter. And so just this week, the team has taken in the hundreds of dollars to the Garretts to help with gas cards, and today, Hundreds of dollars again to Lou Ann and the Barr family. Steve's in the hospital and back and forth there. And, you know, I, I don't even know everything that goes on with, with a lot of stuff, but I, I will just hear the overflow of people saying, you know, Brittany and the team, they're taking meals to this family and they're providing dinner for this family and the care ministry and the nursing homes and all of these things. My, my point is when I think of what I love about the, the local church, I love that people care for each other. I love, I love the change. As a pastor, I've given my life to this. I love seeing change. I'm not, not that I'm against attendance. When they say last week we, we had great numbers with attendance in kids' ministry, and I love hearing the metrics when they're like, we had 500 and some cars, or we had this many hundreds of kids, or, you know, I love that. But I'll be honest with you, what I love even more is when someone comes up to me and says, Pastor Mike, I've been clean three weeks. Pastor Mike, my marriage got back together. Pastor Mike, I passed the test. I'm clean. I got a job. Pastor Mike, I don't look at that stuff no more. I don't go. I had a guy just the other day tell me, he said, Pastor Micah, you know, guys work, buddies, whatever. They're going to this club, going to watch this. I went back to the hotel. I walk away from conversations like that as a pastor and my heart's so full. Not for religious sakes. I just love change. I love when old things pass away and God brings newness. I love when people are like, I found hope, I found peace, I found freedom. I love that the church is able to witness change, conversions. I love the community of church. I have a long list and a little time, but I, I would say close with this for my list. I, I love that, that the truth, the truth is given or should be given at church. You don't know what everyone else is saying and doing in every other place. But as a pastor, I love that if your children or grandchildren come to VBS or summer camp or, or a weekend or, or a gathering or a student night on Sunday night, 
I love that we are going to do our best to speak truth. I think that matters. I think it matters that you and I hear truth. C.S. Lewis said this, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, into that life-giving relationship, into communion with God, into a life-giving seven-day-a-week relationship with our Creator. Like Chance said, you could be afar. But in these gatherings, it gives us the opportunity to be drawn closer. If I was to think personally about God's house, God's house has been my anchor and hope. The amount of times, I realized it would have started early for me when I was dedicated, but, but even from a young age, my mom tells a story when I was around the age of five that I was praying on the left-hand side of a little church. It was a storefront church in Montague, Prince Edward Island, and my mom says that I was a little kid praying at the altar. She thought I fell asleep. She'd come up to wake me up. And when she did, she could hear me praying. I love that from a young age, that if I look at my memories, Holy Spirit moments, married at a church, but more than that, I could start thinking about times that I came as a quitter, times that I came so irritated or frustrated Times that I came down, times that I came like, what is going on now? How are we going to fix this? How are we going to figure it out? And it could be something as simple as a song. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad. And what was one way pulling on the property just starts to shift and turn simply by being in God's house. I've had so many of those moments. I've had moments where I've knelt, where I just felt like, you know what, Micah, humble yourself. I've actually had several times over the years where I felt like the Holy Spirit said, let go of pride or whatever, and I want you to lay prostrate. And I have. I've laid prostrate. I've had times where, because I think everyone, I've shared this before about sometimes in praise and worship, even as a pastor, I'd be like, a couple months ago, I was like, I'm not jumping. I've had moments, I have people share with me, Pastor Micah, I've never raised my hands. I've never cried. What's everyone going to say? What's everyone going to think? I just think there's something about growing in those moments of saying, I'm grateful for God's house. I'm thankful for God's house. When I come here, I'm, with all due respect, I'm not here for everyone's approval. You're not here for everyone's approval. We are here to experience the presence of God and the Spirit of God. And all of those things for me, when I think about it, just make me so, so grateful for God's house. I love the local church. But here's the thing. It's not perfect. The perfect church is heaven. There is no perfect church, there's no perfect pastors, there's no perfect people. If you look down your row right now, you don't see perfect people. And for some it may be a shock or surprise, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. What we can do with the church, what we can do with the church sometimes is we can start viewing it solely, Jenny, through the lens of what can the church do for me? The song, the setting, like we'll, we'll, start, we'll start viewing this, what has the church done for me? And the gift cards are great, and the meals are great, and the visits are great, and they're like, God, let the blood circulation in Jesus' name. Like, like that's all a beautiful thing, but if we're not careful, we'll just start thinking, Nick will start thinking, what has the church done for me? What is the church doing for me? And if there's not enough done did stuff, we're gonna get mad or offended or upset. There is a step beyond just what does the church do for me? And I think it's a fair question because if we don't ask it, we'll live our entire lives only focused on what the church does for us. Instead of maybe taking that extra step and just asking ourselves, what will I do for God's house? 
What will I do for God's house? Instead of maybe viewing it, Kyle, through the lens of, I hope someone does. I hope someone does. Or I hope someone will. Because we could start thinking that. Like, oh, I hope someone straightens up those chairs. I hope someone puts those tissues where they should be. I hope someone wipes up that spot on the floor. I hope someone shovels the entryway. 17 of them out there. I hope someone picks up the trash. I hope someone gives. I hope someone comes and practices. I sure don't want to walk in and nothing. I hope someone turns on the heat. I hope, like we can live our lives starting to think that what am I going to get? The psalmist just says these simple words, I will. Not even we will. He personalized, you know, there's times in your life, you're not gonna have your whole family on board. You're not gonna have all your friends and buddies on board. Not everyone at the gym or your job's gonna, going to agree with what you're doing. He doesn't even say we, he just personalizes it. He says, I will. Just so you know, that's what I'm doing. I will. I wrote down a few things when we think about I will, I will, I will. This week when I was preparing for the message, it reminded me, this is a true story. I've heard this pastor tell the story a few times, but Zach, this pastor tells the story. He has several kids and he asked his wife, babe, what, what is the thing that I can help with throughout the week that would just really help all your stress levels and like, what, what could I do? He heard the story several times. He said that his wife told him, my greatest stress is Monday to Friday, 4 to 6 p.m. All of the kids, all of the homeworks, all of the running them to places, all, like if you could help me Monday to Friday from 4 to 6 would be a godsend. He says that the very first week after committing to his wife that he would help her Monday to Friday, 4 to 6, the very first week, they have a devastating, destructive, when he shares the story, accident of a key family in their church. And he said immediately he could feel, only days in, the weight of, do I help her? Do I leave again to go hospital and... And he says, whether you agree with it or not is not even my point, but he says he made the tough decision to stay and help with his wife and kids. And he tells that this woman, her family, friends of the family, the group began to grow. They all get upset. They all got mad. They all leave the church. I can't believe after all we've done, I can't believe after that our pastor, they left the church. I share this story, and I don't think I've ever shared it publicly, but they say that about a year later, he tells that about a year later, this woman was under conviction about how she left and people they took, and she actually came back to the pastor, and it wasn't just to say, I'm sorry, and I shouldn't have left that way. She came back, and she said, what if I was to start a care ministry for the church Monday to Friday between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m.? You help your wife and kids, I will handle all the crisis calls in that two hour span. They said that that care ministry has become one of the healthiest, most impactful care ministries in church nationwide. It's a very large church, but birthed out of this lady that goes from, I can't believe, to a year later saying, you know what, I will, I will. You see, there's something about, because every one of us could do it right now. You could say, what would you like the worship team to change? What would you like the production team to change? What would you like the kids team to change? What would you like the parking lot team to change? What would you like the online, the social media? But just to press pause sometimes and say, but what can I do? What can I do? I wrote down a few things in closing. I, wrote, I want to share them with you. I will honor God's house. 
These are just a few I wills. Everyone say I will. I will honor God's house. I will prioritize it, respect it, value it. Haggai 1 verse 4, your people are living in beautiful houses, but my temple is still just a heap of stones. It is time for, for someone else to do something. It's time for them. Instead, it's time for you. It's time for you to do something about it. That could be a lot of things, whether or not it's saying, I don't want to be selfish with my spirituality. I will be an inviter. I will, I will ask someone. I'm not going to wait on someone else to find the next soul that needs saved. I'm not going to wait on someone else to find the next marriage falling apart. I'm not going to wait on someone else to find the next person with an addiction or behavior that needs freedom. I will. I'm going to speak up. I'm going to share my faith. I will. Maybe when we talk about honoring God's house, that could be something like unity. Unity. That you're like, when people start causing strife or division or gossiping, the Bible talks a lot about it. And, and I get it, in the moment, no one wants to speak up. Like sometimes we think the win is just not saying something. Well, I didn't say anything. But what if you just own maybe one of your I wills is I will honor God's house by saying something. I will protect unity on the team. I will protect unity on the stage. I will protect unity in the huddle. I will protect unity in the life group. I will. What would happen if God just put it on your heart and maybe it's even outside of some of those areas I mentioned, but, but just to say I will honor God's house. Honor God's house. Years ago, I preached a sermon birthed out of all of the times that I heard people reference Julie. Julie has been with Angel and I since we started in the basement. Julie, very early on, said, Pastor, I'll help clean. Julie Hinklin. Well, we went from the basement of a hotel that was just rented for $600 a week to then going to a gymnasium, set up tear down trailers. We go from there to a building downtown on the square. We looked at 30 some buildings in that season. We then buy some land in Ontario, ultimately buy this, bought this space in place. Had 30 some thousand square feet. Now we've built on since. It's over 60,000 here. And then the property next door and the village offices in town, the Gallium buildings, different things. But the reality is years ago, people would often say, hey, the trash is overflowing, where's Julie? They probably didn't mean anything by it, but it was like, hey, you know, the, those water's leaking. When we first bought this building, the roofs were really bad. On any rainy day, we would always set, up, set out about 10 or 12 buckets. It cost us about, five, I think it was $580,000 to put the various roofs on then. But, but we would have these buckets that were set out. Our driveway was mud. There was no concrete here. So it was dirt driveways and mud puddles, very messy. But if it ever rained, water coming in and things, we'd set out these water buckets. But people would often say years ago, if there was any water or mess or mud, where's Julie? Where's Julie? And they, they probably didn't mean anything by it, but I preached an entire sermon. If you see it, do something. Fix it. Clean it. Wipe it up. Take the trash bag out. Because it's so easy. It's so easy to come in here and be like, wow, the chairs are crooked or the tissues are everywhere. Why the curtains got stains or marks on them? Or how come this wall scuffed up? Or someone banged the door here and this could be packed. It's always easy to think, well, someone else will do it or I hope they do it. That's why we pay the staff. I just want to encourage all of us, maybe just to circle back to the simplicity of, I will honor God's house. I don't need to call for Julie. I will honor God's house. The second thing, I will serve God's house. I will serve God's house. The psalmist said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. 
Like, like if it's as simple as just opening the door, open, shut. If it's like I've got an umbrella walking people to their cars. If I've got a shovel removing storm. The psalmist said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked for years and years. I'll give a, I'll give a wave, I'll give a smile, I will pray, I will, but I just want you to know I'd rather do that. I'll serve in God's house. D.L. Moody said, there are many of us that are willing to do great things for the Lord, but few of us are willing to do little things. The reality is, I hope your heart can be stirred like mine has, but the reality is, People will often say, Pastor, if we ever do a big conference, Pastor, if we ever do a trip to Haiti, Pastor, if we ever go to the DR, and I love all of those things. When we do the harvest party, Pastor, if we do the after school program, and trust me, I love all of those, and I'm glad people want to help. But I pray that as a church, we never get so enamored with the grandeur of the big trip and the big impact and the big influence that we forget that the little things matter too. I will worship in God's house. Everyone say worship. Psalm 5, 7. But by your great mercy, I can enter your house. Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the, to the house of the Lord. Romans 1, one of the most somber Scriptures that is written where it opens the door to all kinds of sin and sexuality and all of those things if you read it in totality. What I want to share with you is just two verses out of Romans 1 verse 24 says, people wanted only to do evil, so God left them, let them go their sinful way. They became completely immoral, used their bodies in shameful ways with each other. They traded. They traded the truth of God for a lie. They bowed down and worshiped the things, the things, the things, the things. I'm not here, I have kids that play sports. I'm not saying it's sports and schedules and life and possessions and materials and all of that stuff, but there is a reality with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life that you and I can stop valuing God and the things of God and give our energy and efforts to everything else. He is the one that should be praised forever. He should not be getting my leftovers. He should not be getting what's left over, the remains, the remnant. He should be getting my best. I refuse. I want to challenge you today. I hope you're just stirred to say, I refuse to lose my praise and worship over inhibitions or fears or perception of what someone else thinks over what someone else in the room might, might say, I would rather that pendulum swing in your heart and you just have something on the inside of you that says, you know what? Sometimes you may see me raise my hands. Sometimes you may see me clap. Sometimes you may see me cry. I love you and I'm glad you're here, but the most important one I'm here for is God. And I will worship in God's house. I'm not coming to sleep. I'm not coming just to finish my coffee. I've had people say they come to meet singles. I've had people say they come for business network and connections. I hope all of those things happen, but if that's ever your number one reason you're here, that's not a good reason. All of those should be secondary to the primary, and that is I have come to worship God. I have come to praise Him. I have come to thank Him. I have come to honor Him. That should be our primary priority. Come on, let's thank God today. I will worship in God's house. I will give to God's house. I will give to God's house. When you think about giving, I have a lot of jokes that come to mind with giving, but one of my favorite is the church that needed money and is a traditional church. I grew up on hymns, songbooks. Anyone else grew up on hymns and songbooks? That was my childhood. I heard the joke about the traditional church. They asked the church, we need money, and if anyone would give $20,000, we'll, we'll let you pick the next three hymns. And the little old lady in the back, she was like, I'll do it, Pastor. And she's like, I'll take him, and I'll take him, <laughs> take him. Yep. 
Almost every story in scripture will reference some form of giving. Give or take, there's about 500 scriptures that talk about faith. It's about 500 scriptures, give or take, that talk about love. There's 2,000 scriptures that talk about money or giving. The parables, 16 out of 38 parables, deal with money. Author Kerry Newoff said this, that the people who object the most to talking about money are usually the people who don't give. I've realized that over the years, not just with giving, but I've realized that with other sermons or subjects that if I talk about marriage or a man and a woman or family or God's principles and plan, usually married people never come up to me afterward like, I can't believe you talked about, it's usually not that. Those people are not going to do that. Usually people who have decided to go against God's plans or principles would be the ones that would be like, I can't believe. The author here is simply saying that if you are trying to honor God with your finances, you're probably not the one getting upset. A lot of times when we get upset, it's the things that maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to our hearts about. Think about this in closing. There's three types of giving. I was sharing with some of the young men in in the lobby after the first service because I asked them, what were your takeaways? And I loved it. I couldn't believe they gave me this answer, but there's three young men in the lobbies and they said our biggest takeaway was when you talked about I will give because we struggle sometimes to give. I couldn't believe that was their takeaway. It actually encouraged me as a pastor that 20 some year olds would even be thinking about that. That's their takeaway. But I shared that $20, just as an example, you could take a 50, you could take a 100, whatever that would be to you. But, but to think about this when it comes to your money. So I believe scripturally there's tithes, offerings, and alms. Not everyone believes that. that that's up to them. New Testament, a lot, of, a lot of people would give everything. So if people tell you tithing is not biblical, I believe it is in the New Testament. But if people say that they want to believe more book of Acts, sold houses, gave everything, that's, that's fine too. Uh, if, if that's how you view it. But when you think about money, money is not good or evil. It has no morals or intentions on its own. Money reflects the character of the user. So I could take this $20 You could take this $20 and spend it on something that fuels a bad habit in your life. Or I could take this $20 and pay for someone's lunch today. You could take this $20 and use it for something evil, or you could take the $20 and use it for something good. But it's in your hand. When God has given you these blessings, it's in your hand to decide what you do with the blessings that you've been given. They say statistically, 50% of people in churches give absolutely nothing, zero. They say 30% then give a very minimal amount. Those are studies. On average, on average, this is just nationwide, the average church member contributes between 1.5% and 2.5% of their total income not just to church or ministry, that also includes community mission. Generally speaking, they say that 20% of people give 80% of what a church needs. 20% give 80%. And we are the body of Christ. Can you imagine in your body and my body if you and I had to live on 20%, 20% of organs, 20% of breath, 20% of whatever that would be. Think about it today. You imagine, now now the flip side of it is, I am coming to a close, the flip side of it is, I can't believe what churches do on 20%. Like when I think of the baptisms, 191 last year, when I think of missions, When I think of the community, we're talking about TV and people clap. We're we're talking about billboards. We're talking about VBS and camps. And when you think about what churches do on 20% of people giving, 
Can you imagine what you could do 30, 40, 50, 60 percent? Can you imagine generally in the body of Christ? I didn't realize growing up, when I'm a child, when I'm a teenager, I didn't realize growing up, Regina, I'm sure we could sit and share many stories right now of the people in hindsight that we look back that the reason Micah is here, the reason Regina is here right now is because there was people long before us, the Scott Rideouts of the world, that was giving and serving, and whether it was monies or their time, but the amount of people that was like, I am not just doing this for now, I'm doing it for next. Like you guys pulling concrete now. But for years, there's no concrete. In other words, you pull in a vehicle, you pull onto something today that someone before you believed in. You're sitting in chairs right now that some of you didn't pay for. You're hearing a sound system. They just bought a new board and subwoofers, several hundred thousand dollars, and some of it's still on the way. All of it, but, but online, for example, some of you right now are hearing God's word through a camera online all over the world. Someone covers that. Someone pays for it. And when you think about it, like when, when I will, I will, I will, will people outside of the Lord's return, will people five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, will, will there be people reaping the benefits of God's presence, God's word, God's spirit because of what I'm doing right now in 2024? Because there once was a time, five or 10 or 15 years ago, people were doing things that you and I are reaping the rewards of now. I've heard it put this way, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. Those of you, just by show of hands, how many of you are parents? Parents? Oh, a lot of you, parents. One of my favorite things with my kids, they're now all grown up and buying houses and getting married and I'm old. One of one of my favorite things growing up was taking my kids to the park. One of my favorite things. I don't think there's a park anywhere around here, Chance. You, you, you have a, a baby. I don't think there's a park anywhere around here that I haven't been to multiple times. Played basketball there, thrown footballs there, got dirty there, my kids got hurt there. Like, we have done monkey bars. Who, who's the kids that broke arms or like hurt their eyes or shoulders or? Ellie cut her chin, so will get a scar or whatever. Makai broke his arm. I have share, I'm always the, and this is everything though, this is rafting, this is life. This is, I'm always the parent where Angel can be like, and what were you thinking? <laughs> uh, what is it exactly you were doing? But when you think of a park, Ontario, Lexington, down by the police station, going out of Belleville, like I, I've been to the, I love the parks. Vacations, we would find parks. I have it written in my phone. Not that you should think this, but it's almost like, because I, I do, I tell Angel, like, this could be the last whatever with Jalen before she gets married. This could be the last, whatever. like this, I, I can't help it. My mind just thinks those things. And I have it written in my phone the day that my son, I'm, so I would push him on the swing, Micaiah Solomon, and my son would always want to go, that's why I probably broke broken arms and stuff, but he would always want to go as high as he could. I mean, like, just get that swing going just as high. And so I'd be pushing him, and then he would always want me to get push, 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 and then run underneath of him out the other side. I have it written in my phone, Matt, the day that Micaiah told me, he figured out how to do his legs, out and back, and out and back and out. And I'll never forget the day, because my last kid, never forget the day that he told me, you don't have to push me anymore, dad. I got it, I know how to go high, I don't need you anymore. I wrote it down in my phone, but I was thinking this week how unbelievable it would be 
if when it come to serving, if when it come to giving, can you imagine if Christians ever got to the point where they were like, you don't gotta push me no more. I've been in several hundred churches, Kyle. I've been in churches where they did three offerings. I've been in churches, my wife would tell you, where they had a calculator down front. I've been in churches where they were like, hey, David, they said this. If you're an elder, you give this much. If you're a deacon, you give this much. I've been in churches where they'd be like, how many 500s, how many thousands, how many 5,000s, how many people standing up and down? I've been, in, I've been in churches where I feel like just, even now, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's been several months, we don't even take up an offering now. We tell you that you can give as you exit and giving station, whatever, but this is before I was even thinking about this. I would just love for StorySide to get to the point where it's like, I'm not twisting no one's arm. I'm not begging you to help with kids check in. I'm not like, please, will someone park a car? These people coming in, they need hope. They need peace. They need the joy. Please, will someone carry an umbrella? Please, is there anyone that'll tithe? Please, would you honor God with your, not, not doing it. I'll teach it. I want you to think about how awesome it would be if we ever got to the point where we're like, you don't gotta beg me. You don't have to please. No, you don't even have to push me. I'll serve, I'll help, I'll give, I'll worship, I'll honor. I will, I will, I will. I've gone over my time, but my final thing is just what the psalmist said, I will dwell. Everyone say, I will dwell. This is probably the biggest of all of them. This is probably the one that's gonna get the most attacked in your life. If you say, Pastor Micah, which one you think is the hardest? It's this one right here. I'm gonna say it to you and then we'll pray. But I actually think the dwell is probably the one that the devil is going to try to pick at and he's gonna try to point out and he's going to try to pull you away from, I will dwell. There's always going to be something that frustrates you or irritates you. There's always going to be something you don't understand. There's always going to be something you're like, why are they doing that? Why'd they move that? How come they're doing that? There's always going to be someone that walks by and you're like, hey, why didn't they wave? Why didn't they shake my hand? Why didn't they fist bump? Why didn't they like something? Pastor Lonnie's thing like, Pastor Micah, they didn't do nothing. I didn't even get a sup, nothing. <laughs> and the dwell could turn into, I will dwell until. I will dwell until I don't like this, or I will dwell until I don't like that, or I will dwell until. I didn't get no gift card. Why well, Garrett's and bars? I paid my own $3.39 a gallon. Is that your until? No one come and prayed for my cold hand. Is that your until? Is that your until? I can't believe that usher. I can't believe that greeter. I can't believe that one lady at the check-in. I can't. Is that your until? I don't think they took the strong enough stand on what I can't believe they posted. I can't. Is that your until? No one spotlight me yet. They got people up there spotlight, been here six months, 12 months. I've been here 12 years. Is that your until? What's your until today? What is it that the enemy is like, oh, I'm getting them exactly where I want them because they have all this fine print to their faith. They have all these contingencies on their Christianity. I will until, until what? Until he doesn't answer your prayer the way you wanted him to? Until you hope for this and you got that, is that your until? Until you're like, God, I thought now you're in a season of life where it's not what you thought. Is that your until? Or is your heart to say, I will? The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at, 
Not just the good times, not just the great times, not when everything's working out the way I want it. I will bless the Lord. I will, I will, I will win, Micah, at all times. At all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Why? Because I already made a promise. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm going to make it all the way to the end. I will. If we had time, or if you're taking notes, very quickly I'll give you this as we pray. The Apostle Paul, there's about 12 things he said he struggled with, but I will just give you a couple. 2 Peter 3.16, he said, the Apostle Paul said, I have gone through some very serious misunderstandings. How many had misunderstandings in church? He said, I have gone through unmet expectations and selfishness. It's Philippians 2. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, I went through abandonment. People left me. He named some of them by name. They left me. They let me down. I counted on them. I learned I couldn't. He writes in Acts 9, he tells about criticisms and skepticisms that he felt were unfair, that people were questioning his motives. I feel the Holy Spirit even saying it. In Acts 15, he writes about disagreements, people that got to the point they couldn't even work together. He writes in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22 to 29, he writes about his disappointments. How many ever been disappointed before? This same guy that you would read all of this and you'd be like, there's no way this guy is still an I will. There's no way with misunderstandings and unmet expectations and abandonment and criticism and skepticism and disagreements and disappointment, there's no way this guy's still in the game. But on the contrary, this same guy says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, so my dear brothers and sisters, so my dear story side, so my dear Micah and Angel, so my dear Brian and Bree, so my dear Joel McKenzie, so my dear sound team, so my dear ushers and greeters and kids workers and stand strong. Don't let anything change you. Don't let it harden your heart. Don't, it, don't make it put walls up in your life and you're like, I'm not doing that no more. I'm sick of that. Don't let anything change you. Always give yourself a little bit because you know once you're bit once and once you're bit twice and once you're bit a hundred times. Now you're just going to give a little and only be one foot in and one foot out. It's not what he says. He said, give yourself fully, all in, to the work of the Lord. You know, you know that you're working the Lord. You know that the baptisms, you know that the dedications, you know that the outreach, you, knew, you know that the helping men and women find freedom from addiction. You know the worship sets and the practice. You know the hours you put in Johnny. You know your work's never wasted. You know the VBS, you know the summer camp. You know the smile, you know the wave. He said, you know it's never wasted. Well, that doesn't make sense, you just said. There's misunderstandings and selfishness and abandonment and criticism and disagreement. You just said, I know. Even in the middle of that, don't let anything change you. Give yourself, and he tells them, just, just rest assured, never wasted. You never gave one time that was wasted. You didn't serve one time that was wasted. You not, it wasn't wasted. Why does he have to tell the church in Corinth that? I think he has to tell them that because every one of us will start thinking it was wasted. Why did I do that? Why did I give that? Why? I think Paul knew you have to remind yourself, you keep giving, you keep serving, it's not wasted. As you close your eyes, allow me the opportunity to pray with you today. 
Can we say the two words together, I will? Just with eyes closed all over the room, can we say it again, I, I will? Can we say it one more time, I, what is it the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, I will? I will work on my marriage. I will keep praying for my children. I will keep my faith. As for me and my house, we will. What is your I will today? Maybe it's one of the things that I shared about this morning. Maybe for someone they're saying, I will repent. I will get right with God. I will turn my life around. Maybe for others you are stirred, I will serve. I will let some of the walls down. I will give myself fully. I will, I will, I will. What is, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now? I will let it go. I will turn the page. I will, I will, I will. I, I would love after hours and hours of studying and praying and preparing, I would love in this moment right now for it just to culminate with you accepting whatever it is that God is speaking to you right now. I will, I will, I will. What is it? And are you ready to tell him I will? No contingencies, no strings attached. No, I will until. No, I will. I will. God, I pray for every person on site and online right now. I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to do the work in their heart that you intended. I pray that someone would embrace the I will today. They would embrace it. I pray that someone would have that turning moment we talked about earlier, where it started today is one thing, but with the help of the Holy Spirit and your Holy Word, it's turning. It's turning. Their faith is being infused. They're feeling the confidence of God calling them back to their I will. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you thankful for Jesus today?